We are going to be reading this morning from Matthew chapter 26, and we're going to be looking at verse 30 through verse 46. Matthew 26, verse 30 through 46. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will scatter. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. And Peter answered and said to him, even if all are made to stumble because of you. I will never be made to stumble. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, And he said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. And he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face. And he prayed, saying, oh, my father. If it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, What? You could not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time, he went away and he prayed, saying, O my father, if this cup cannot pass from me, unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them, and he went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. I'd like you, to, you're, you're in Matthew 26, hopefully. I'd like you to put, place a marker there, and I'd like you to take your Bible and turn to Hebrews chapter 5. We're going to be back in Matthew 26, but I want you to, to uh, turn to Hebrews chapter 5, and we're going to look at that in just a few moments. Uh, Hebrews chapter 5. What do you think about when you think of the words, of words like dream, or aspire, or passion, or desire, or even conquer? Most of us, when we hear words like that, they're pretty positive. Those are things that we, we like. We like words like that, aspire, and passion, and conquer, and those kinds of things. They appeal to the American individuality and even desire for self-determination. And even as human beings, we have this desire for self-determination and, and, uh, and individuality. But what do we do with God's desire for us to submit to him? very unnatural. It's unnatural as human beings for us to want to submit to the will of another, to place ourselves under the submissive, under in, in submission to someone else. That rubs us wrong. We feel like we're not in control then. It's not, we're not, uh, it's not, uh, our individuality is being uh, compromised. Our self-determination is being thwarted. But God does call us to that kind of obedience. He calls us to obedience that's not just compliance, to actual heartfelt obedience. Many large companies have entire departments that are dedicated to compliance, a compliance department. And most good managers want to make sure that their 
complying with the compliance department. But nobody, nobody lives their lives to comply with a compliance department. No manager of a company of a corporation or leader of a corporation gets up and goes to work in the morning and says, man, I can't wait to comply with this department, with all these policies. No, they just kind of do it. They know they got to do it, so they got to make sure they're in compliance, so they stay in compliance, so that they can do whatever else they're doing. They can make money, they can produce whatever they're producing, whatever, all that kind of thing. They just want to make sure they're staying in compliance. In fact, compliance can kind of become a sort of a nuisance and can kind of become frustrating, all the different regulations and policies. I just want to be able to go to work and do what I'm supposed to do or make what I'm supposed to make or produce what I'm supposed to produce, and yet all these compliance issues are in the way. But the, but the obedience that God calls us to is a different kind of obedience. And what is exampled in this passage is that kind of obedience, an utter and complete submission to the will of God. Now, let me ask you another question. It is true that Jesus, because he is God, could not sin when he's on this earth. And yet, how could, if he truly couldn't sin, how could he really, truly be tempted? I think that the answer is in this text in Hebrews. Would you notice what it says in Hebrews chapter 5? And pick up here in verse, well, we'll, we'll pick up in verse 5 here. It says, so also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you, as he also said in another place, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh when he had offered up prayers and supplication with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. That's this passage. That's Matthew 26. Offering up tears and supplications and vehement cries to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because, because of his godly fear, though he was a son, Though he was the son of God, he, did you catch, look at what it says there, he what? He learned obedience by the things which he suffered. He learned. Now how does God the son learn? Even when Jesus was a boy, it says that he he grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. He grew. Here it says that he learned obedience. How did Jesus learn obedience? Well, learning requires, a true learning requires experience. And what it's saying in this passage is that Jesus experienced true obedience. True submission to the Father. You see, Jesus throughout his life, we've seen this through the book of Matthew, Jesus throughout his life, he, he has always submitted to the Father. He's always been there to do the will of the Father. That's been his goal. He has said it time and time again. He says, my very meat, my sus spiritual sustenance is to do the will of the Father. John chapter 4. He he, he, is, he, he is in complete alignment with the will of his Father. But in this passage, Jesus is struggling. He is in anguish and grief and pain and turmoil. Maybe, maybe for the first time in Jesus' ministry, his his will is not completely aligned with God's will. Now, he's not sinning. We know that. That can't be. But he actually is going to say to his father, not my will, but yours be done. See, Jesus, though he is God, is a distinct person from the father. And so there are two separate wills. And for all of eternity, they have been 
in lockstep unity with each other, and even while he was on this life, in this life, they were in unity with each other. And the Bible doesn't say this, but, but maybe for the first time, but certainly during this time, there is a struggle. Why is there a struggle? There is a struggle because, look, notice what Hebrews says, there is suffering. Jesus learned obedience. He was under temptation, and he learned obedience by the suffering that he went through. So it truly can be said that he was tempted at all points like as we are, yet without sin. What does, it's interesting, when I was studying this passage, Matthew 26, I always ask this question after I'm reading through the passage several times, I'm asking this question. What is God's intention for the reader of this passage? What is God's purpose? That's a really important question to ask. What is his purpose for this passage as it's going to be read? Sometimes you can discern that from the, the human author's intention, from what Matthew's intention is. It's going to be consistent with what God's intention is. But we actually have a passage in Hebrews that, that comments on this passage in Matthew that tells us exactly why. So that we understand how Jesus learned obedience. And so we are going to learn obedience from the example of Christ in this passage. But we're also going to see something else in this passage we're going to see some others that were not obedient. They had not learned obedience. And that's the disciples. And that's actually where we pick up. We're going to, we're going to see, here's what we're going to see before we get there. Here's what we're going to see. We're going to see that obedience means three things. It, uh, in or, learning obedience needs the humility to listen to warnings. We're going to see that in the passage. Learning obedience needs the, obe uh, 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 the humility to listen to warnings. Number two, learning obedience includes utter dependency on God and struggling in prayer. And number three, learning obedience requires consistent alertness and prayerfulness. Those are the three things that we're going to see in order for us to understand this entire concept of learning obedience. So first of all, learning obedience needs humility to listen to warnings. Verse 30 says this, and they, when they had sung a hymn, remember, they're, they're in the upper room. They have um, had communion together, the very first communion together. They had sung a hymn together. And now they're going to a place that was very familiar to them. They went often there, the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives was uh, on the other side of the Kidron Valley um, from Jerusalem, so they were kind of away from everything. They had to go down in the Kinder Valley, come up the other side, up to the Mount of Olives. Uh, there were no doubt olive trees there. That's why it was called the, the, the Mount of Olives, for good reason. And that was a place where they were able to get away from everybody, and this is something that would happen quite often. Verse 31 says, Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. So he gets all these, he gets his disciples together. Luke, the Luke passage says, as was his, what was a custom for them to go to the Mount of Olives, as they did this often. And he says, all of you will be made to stumble. It could be translated, all of you will be made to fall away because of me tonight. Now, Jesus had told them before, they are going to be, uh, I am going to be betrayed. He is trying to tell them here, it's tonight. <laughs> tonight, I'm going to be betrayed. Matthew 17, 22 says, Now while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hand of men, and they will, uh, and they will kill him, and the third day they will be raised, and they were exceedingly sorrowful. John adds to this whole idea of betrayal and stumbling. He says, in, Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come, tell, Jesus tells his disciples, that you will be scattered each to his own and will, leave him, and will leave me alone, 
And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. Jesus predicts that these disciples, all 11 of them at this point, are going to deny and to scatter. They're going to scatter. They're going to fall away. Essentially, they're all going to deny Christ. And the scriptural basis that he mentions here is from the book of Zechariah. It says, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. That's from Zechariah chapter 13, verses 7 through 9. It says, awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion, says the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Then I will turn my hand against the little ones. And it shall come to pass in the land, says the Lord, two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it. I will bring the one-third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people, and each one will say, the Lord is my God. Jesus is saying that the disciples, originally the twelve, now Judas has left, so it's the, the eleven, are going to be representative of the 12 tribes of Israel in the sense that they will be scattered just as Israel will be scattered as the shepherd as, as the sword comes against the shepherd who is Jesus. But this passage also teaches that there will be a remnant that will call on the name of, of uh, call on God's name. And of course we know that that will be true as well. Then verse 32 of, Acts, of Matthew 26 here says, but, if, but after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. He, boy, he's laying it all out. <laughs> he says, the hour's coming. He's talked about this hour before. You all are going to scatter and deny me. I'm going to be betrayed. You're going to scatter and deny me. But after I've been raised, <laughs> I'm going to come back to Galilee and I'm going to stand before you. Now, it's amazing how... You know, we've got a bird's eye view of this, and it's amazing how much the disciples don't get. Even after he dies and is, and is put into the ground, they're, remember the, the disciples on the road to Emmaus, totally confused about what happened and what's going on and how this is all going to play out. So these disciples say, Peter actually stands up, but we're so surprised by that because he never wants to say anything. Peter, that's a sarcasm. Verse 33, Peter answers and said to him, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. So Peter, we know Peter. Peter says some really wonderful things like you are Lord and God. And other times, Peter, as representative of the disciples, puts his foot in his mouth. And this is one of those times. Peter, in fact, Peter Peter says, even if the rest of these guys, I mean, he, he sticks his neck out there, even if the rest of these guys are all made to stumble, I will not be made to stumble. Jesus corrects him, verse 2434. He say, says directly to Peter, in fact, there's a sense in which Peter is going to stumble more than all of them. Verse 34, Assuredly, I say that this night... Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Now, apparently in that day, uh, there was a, the rooster would crow, and uh, he would crow usually, um, some, some say that, he crow, that the, the rooster would crow about three times between 12 and 3 a.m. Uh, another, uh, I believe it's the Mark passage, says before the, the rooster crow, crows twice. Either way, here's the point. Jesus is saying, tonight, before midnight, or right around midnight, by that point, you will have denied me three times. I mean, understand, what we're getting to here as, as we see the, this chronology is, it's one event on, on top of another. You know, as we go through the book of Matthew, you, there might be days and even weeks that go by before you see the one narrative that goes to another. Here now, this is... This is by the minute and the hour that's happening here. And Peter is saying, I will not, no matter what, else, what anybody else does, no matter all these other disciples, I will not be made to stumble. He says, no, you, you'll deny me three times. Like, you know, it's kind of like you think to yourself, 
You say, you, didn't, you, you say something once, you might say it by accident, slip of the tongue, you got a little afraid, whatever. But you say something definitively three times, there's no denying the denial. <laughs> right? And so Peter is going to... Exa- but here's what Peter, Peter insists. He, he, verse 35, he comes back and says, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And catch this. The other disciples, <clears throat> I don't know, the other disciples, you know, they're hearing this. And my imagination, this could be wrong, but my imagination is he's, he's standing up and going, even if all these other people will deny you, and I, I will never deny you. Uh, at this point, they're speaking up, and it says, and so said all the disciples. All the disciples said, no, I, I will too. I'm, I'm not going to deny you either. They're all, they're all saying, we won't deny you. We won't, we won't. We'll, go, we'll die for you. Uh, the, the parallel passage, John, uh, says, verse, verse 37, Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. Jesus answered and said, will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. So it's interesting, the Matthew passage, Peter has the last word, but in John, in John, the John passage, Jesus has the last word on this. Either way, Peter is acting very foolishly here. Peter is really demonstrating immaturity, spiritual immaturity. So so there is a difference, by the way, between spiritual immaturity and and unbelief. We have a perfect example here of Judas who betrays Jesus, goes off the scene, never comes back, dies, and goes to hell. But Peter, on the other hand, Peter is going to deny Jesus, but what does he do later along with all the other disciples? He repents. So it's important to understand, there's a sense in which we can understand that denial versus betrayal of this is that God, God somehow in his grace, he, is, he, he uses repentance. These, these disciples are very far from perfection. <laughs> and yet God is going to use all of this in their lives, and they are going to eventually become quite spiritually mature. They will have learned obedience. But at this point, they have not. They haven't learned obedience yet. What does it look like when someone, had, when a Christian, has not learned obedience? What does it look like? Number one, we tend to compare ourselves with others. An immature Christian, a Christian who has not learned obedience, compares himself with, some, with others. The Bible says if you compare yourself among yourself, you're unwise. And yet, an immature Christian will very often say, well, you know, I, I'm, I got this problem, but I don't got that problem. I'm not that bad, you know. Yeah, yeah, I got my issues, but you know, compared to other people, you know, everybody sins, and I'm not, uh, you know, I, uh, and, and so I, uh, yeah, I'm a sinner, but you know, like, I, you know, at least I do this and I do that. But he compares, is comparing. Peter makes this comparison, but in his comparison, he's like, I'm better than everybody else. It's it's the height of of. Uh, of egotism. Number two, our, our assertions are not based on experience. They are based on pride. What does it look like to be immature and, have un- and not have learned obedience yet? Our, we assert things, we have confidence in things, not based on experience, but based on our own self our own strength, the strength of our own will. That's what Peter did here. Peter had confidence in his will that in no way was he going to deny Jesus. In no way was he going to fall away from Jesus. He had confidence in his own will. Immaturity immaturity says, I would never do that. Immaturity says that. I would never. That person did that. I would never do that. Maturity says, I hope I wouldn't, 
but I don't know. Wherein you think you stand, take heed lest you fall. Number three, we don't realize our utter dependency on God, on Christ. These disciples were convinced by, the sheer, by their own sheer will, despite God's, Christ's prediction, that they're going to fall away. They are defying the very prediction of Christ and saying, we will not do what you just predicted that we're going to do. They are more confident about them, their own will and their own ability and their own personhood than they are about the prediction of Christ, the, war the warning of Christ. Christ is warning them, but they're not heeding the warning. And that, by the way, is something that's very common of a mature believer. They don't heed the warnings that are around them. They don't look at the warnings. They don't pay attention to the warnings around them. God God gives us, in his word, warnings about things. But we defy them because we have our own confidence in our own flesh. Paul said, in me, that is, my flesh, dwells no good thing. That's maturity. And so we see the disciples as representatives of Israel. They fail and they are going to be scattered. But Jesus in this passage, is going to learn obedience. Now, that doesn't even sound right, right? Jesus is going to learn obedience, but that's what Hebrews tells us. How is he going to learn this? By experiencing, by experiencing this struggle. Picking up in verse 36, it says, Then Jesus came with him to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter, and the two, two sons of Zebedee, and he, became, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but, you, but as you will." So they come, they're in the Mount of Olives, and they come to this place called Gethsemane. Gethsemane literally means oil press. So this is very likely a place where they, were pre they would take the olives from the olive trees, they would pick them, and they would be able to press out the olives and make olive oil. This was very likely on the western slope, slopes of the, of the Mount of Olives. John tells us in his text that they were in a garden. So we know it's a garden of Gethsemane. John chapter 18, verse 1 says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out to the disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden. And he and his disciples entered, and Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. This is a common place for them to go. They would go to this garden of Gethsemane to, to fellowship, uh, to rest, arguably to pray, so they go to this place that is so familiar to them. They go there so often that Judas knows that this is where they're going to be. And so, uh, and so he is able to betray them at this place. Now, just as a thought here, kind of a side thought, do you think that Jesus knew that, that Judas knew where he was? Just a side thought, I think so. I think Judas knew, I think Jesus very likely knew that Judas was going to betray him exactly there. And Jesus doesn't leave somewhere else. He doesn't go somewhere else away from this, what's going to happen. He goes to the place where he, I think, knows he's going to be, he's going to be betrayed by Judas. And the whole way, he's struggling. He's, su he's suffering. He's struggling with this. And we could see his humanity here, can't we? This deep struggle that he is going through. And this struggle, he says, he says to the, there's sort of an outer circle of disciples and an inner circle of disciples. He says, sit here a while while I go pray over there. And then he takes Peter and James and John and he goes with them. Jesus 
actually, interestingly enough, doesn't want to be alone in his time of deep despair. He wants company. He wants help. And yet he, he has already said he knows he's going to be alone except with his father. And yet he still asks them, would you come with me? Would you be with me? Now, we then find uh, that it says that he had began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Don't glaze over those words too quickly. Sorrowful, sorrow has to do with grief to the point of physical pain. Have you experienced that before? Have you experienced the level of grief that hit you in the gut so hard that you it actually, there was nothing physically wrong with you, it didn't, it's not like you, but you actually felt physical pain. Pain. I, I can tell you I felt that, not to this extent, I wouldn't dare say that, but I, I felt that. The grief was so bad, I actually started, it felt painful. That's what, he's going, that's what Jesus is going through. He's going through a kind of grief where he is in so much grief, it's, it is, he, is in, he is in pain. So grief, and then it says deeply, it, sorrow is the idea of deep distress. Deep distress. This, this, he's sorrowful and deeply distressed. To, he's under stress. He's under trouble. He's upset. You ever experienced that kind of grief on one hand and extreme stress on the other hand? That's what Jesus is going through. And can I say it this way? He's, gone, he's going through this to a greater extent than you and I will ever or have ever gone through it. If we've gone through grief, we can know to some degree what he's going through. You've got this grief on one hand and this stress on the other hand. It's causing pain, physical pain. It's causing just there's there's there's... A, a, a vexation of spirit. And he says to his disciples, watch with me. Well, he goes in and he goes a little further in, into, away from his disciples. In fact, uh, the Luke passage says that it was a stone throw away. So imagine you've got disciples of this garden. And by the way, uh, archaeological evidence from this garden indicates that there was probably a cave where they actually pressed pressed down the, the olives. It's possible that Jesus was either in the cave or outside the cave, and the garden was around the cave. But either way, you've got, you've got the disciples, all the disciples, and then the three specific disciples, Peter, James, and John, went with, with uh, Jesus. And then Jesus goes a stone throw away, whatever that is, a stone throw away from these three disciples, according to the text. And the Mark text says he went a little further and fell on the ground. This man is in, in deep grief. He's in extreme sorrow. He is in pain and anguish and stress. And he falls prostrate on the ground. And as he prays, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, yours are, uh, but yours be done. The Luke passage says that as he prays this, an angel appears to him from heaven and strengthens him. We see the very Son of God in turmoil and pain and suffering, and he cries out to his Father with, with according to the Hebrew, Hebrews pa passage, vehement cries. And an angel comes and strengthens him, comforts him, motivates him. And in the Luke passage, verse 44, chapter 22 says, Then his sweat became like, not great drops of blood, but like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. It's a description of a man who is in so much pain, so much stress, so much anguish that he sweats to the point where it is dropping to the ground and he is, he is in turmoil 
and pain. You ever been there, by, not to that extent, but you ever been there before where you are in so much stress you start sweating? <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> and, uh, there's different times where that happens. You, you get whatever it is happening, and, and man, you, you break out into a cold sweat. Well, Jesus is sweating to the point that he is in this, this scene of pain and turmoil. And an angel comes and appears to him and, 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 and strengthens him. Now, I'm not going to make a doctrine out of this, but I, I'm just going to tell you that I do wonder when we cry out to God this way, in struggle and in pain. Notice what Jesus, see, see Jesus does exactly what we, sh, what we all should do when we are in grief and stress and struggle and suffering and pain. He cries out to God. He cries out. See, our, often what we want to do is we do one of two things. We are just emotional and we're just, just totally go kind of crazy or whatever. We're just... Or we're stoic and we don't even want to admit that there's a problem. And we even don't want to pray because we're just sort of like, I don't want to pray anything because I just got to stiffen my upper lip. No, Jesus pours out, pours himself out before his Father. And that is, a, that is, a, is to be an example to you and to me as we go through grief and str- stress and difficulty in life. Hebrews 2, verse 10, 18 says, For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. And Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, For we do not have an high priest who cannot sympathize with, it, with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Now what Jesus prays, he prays, Let this cup pass from me. Well, what is the cup? Well, Jesus has mentioned what this cup is in the past. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 22 through 23, it says, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I'm about to be baptized with? They said to him, We are able. And he said to them, You will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and to my, my left is not mine to give. So he talks about this cup. What's the cup? The cup is his death. Why was Jesus in such anguish over his death? It wasn't just the dying. It wasn't just the suffering. No doubt, it's not in the text here, but no doubt it was because he was about to be separated from his father for the very first time and the only time ever in all of eternity past and in eternity future he's going to be separated from his father and the anguish of that causes him to cry out to his father let this cup pass from me the cup is a reference to the wrath of god that is going to be poured out on jesus we don't have the time to take the time to there, it's all over the Old Testament. Many, many, many different times it talks about that. But for example, in Job 21, verse 20, it says, let his eyes see his destruction and let, his, let him drink of the wrath of the Almighty. This cup is the pouring of the wrath of God on his Son. And that is what Jesus is suffering over. The notion that 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 the father would not only be separated from his son, but would literally pour out his wrath on his own son. Jesus says, let this cup pass from me. But then he says this. He learned obedience. He says this, nevertheless, not as I will, but as your, but as you will. Not my will, but yours be done. He was willing to go to the cross. Why? To take on the wrath of God as our substitute so that we could receive the righteousness of Christ. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. Now, there are a lot of things that I can say about this, but I think we need to understand this simple truth. Jesus understood 
Jesus understood his own dependency of his uh, on his father. He came to his father fully dependent, dependent, agonizing over his uh, over what he was about to do in his suffering, in his despair, in his grief, in his pain. He went to his father and prayed to his father over these things. He didn't ignore it. He didn't just brush it aside. He didn't just say it's not there. He agonized over it. He processed it, if you will, to his heavenly Father. We see the same thing in Psalm 42 through 43. I wanted to read part of the passage. We won't take the time, but write that that, that passage down. There in that passage, Psalm 42 through 43, the, the psalmist agonizes to his Father, God. And this is something, if we're going to learn obedience, look, really, seriously, at some point in your life, you're not going to want to do what God wants you to do. Maybe at many, many, many points in your life, you're not going to want to do what God wants you to do. And you're going to have to say, nevertheless, not your will, but mine, not my will, but yours be done. But with that Agonize over it with God. Wrestle with it with God. Struggle. Don't ignore it. Wrestle with it with your God. So how did the disciples fare during this time, this hour of betrayal? Well, verse 40 Jesus asked the disciples, would you just stay here and watch with me? And he came to his disciples and found them, what? Sleeping. And he said to Peter, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Three times, actually, Jesus does this. He goes to, he, he says, would you please watch with and then would you, he goes and prays. And then he watches again. And you have this, this going on. And ver, verse 40 is a very interesting verse. He asks them, verse 41, to watch and to pray. Now, initially, you might think to yourself, he's asking them to watch, to kind of watch out for those who are going to betray him. Like, okay, I'm going to go pray. Would you please keep an eye out? But Jesus has something else in mind when it comes to this watching and praying. Notice what he says here. Watch and pray, why? To protect me? No, that's not what Jesus is concerned about. Watch and pray, lest you do what? You enter into temptation. What's the temptation going to be? To do exactly what Jesus already prophesied that they're going to do. The temptation is to fall away. And that's exactly what happens. They do fall away. They deny Christ. They're not present at the cross for their Lord and Savior. Their friend. He says, watch and pray. Why? Lest you enter into temptation. And he is, by do, saying these words, telling us a very important key for us to not enter into temptation. How do we learn in obedience? Well, we need to do the exact opposite of what the disciples did. The disciples, what did they do? They fell asleep. They, they didn't watch and pray. What does it mean to watch and pray? Actually, the Greek basically could be translated, keep on watching and keep on praying. It is a continuous action that God wants us to do. He's saying, be alert to the potential and the reality of the temptations around you. Continually watch, continually Continually pray. Be ready for those temptations. That's what he's telling the disciples. Be ready and pray. That's how you avoid temptations. And then he says, the spirit, what's the problem? The problem is the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Why do we succumb to temptation? Because your flesh and my flesh are weak. Boy, this is very different, a very different kind of thinking. The disciples are saying, I'm gonna, we're going to be okay. We're, my will, I'm going to be able to do this, and I'm not going to betray you. And 
No, no. Now Jesus is telling them. I wonder even if Jesus is saying when he says the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak, telling them this, he's telling them this, if he's not pointing out the problem, like in the sense that if you would realize that the problem is your own weakness in your own flesh, then you would be, that would be like half the battle. Either way, that's exactly what we need to realize in our lives. Why are we utterly dependent upon Christ for obedience? It is because the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. Failure number two, verse 43, we see, he comes back again. They're sleeping again. And it says, for their eyes were heavy. Now, you might, might say, what is wrong with these people? But they, were, they had had a very big meal. Passover meal is no joke. It is not, you know, a little appetizer. This is a full meal. They're going to a quiet, cool place at night in a garden, peaceful, serene, and their body just says, I want to sleep. And their, it, says, it says, for their eyes were heavy. You could, almost, um, you could almost imagine Matthew as one of the disciples realizing this. Sort of, I remember that my eyes being just really heavy. And Jesus comes to them again. The Mark passage adds this. They did not know what to answer him. He asks, why can't you stay awake? And they did not know what to answer Boy, they knew what to answer before, didn't they? I won't deny you. But now, at this point, they're, they're like, second time, they're like, I got nothing. I don't know why I keep doing this. <laughs> and then finally, he left them. The time, third time he comes back, he left them, comes back. He says, why are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the, and he just goes right into the answers his own question. Behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is being betrayed into, into the hands of sinners. Rise, let's be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. It's, he's here. And the prediction that Jesus makes is exactly what is going to take place as we will see in the future. What can we learn from this? Well, I am thankful to tell you that Peter learned something from all of this, eventually. It took a while. Because in... Peter's epistle, he says, chapter 5, verse 8, 1 Peter, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And that night, Peter was devoured. And I could, I, I could just imagine Peter penning this down, going, be sober, watch, be ready, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, and he is going to devour you if you're not sober and ready. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says this, Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. The Lord knows how to Deliver the godly out of temptation. Why? Why does Jesus know that? He knows it not only academically, he knows it experientially because Jesus went through it. He knows the temptation you're going through. He understands it. He knows the struggle you're facing. He knows it. And he knows how to get you out of it. You need to cry out to Christ. Who knows? And watch. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says this, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. So what do we need to do? 
Three things we can take from this passage. There's more, but three things at least to take from this passage. Number one, self-centered overconfidence will cause us to ignore God's warnings and fall into temptation. Self-centered overconfidence will cause us to ignore God's warnings and fall into temptation. Understand that the self-centered overconfidence demonstrates not necessarily that you are a betrayer of Christ, but you, are, you have not yet learned obedience. Number two, pouring our hearts out to the Lord during times of grief and stress will cause us to avoid temptations that may follow. See, when you... When you're going through stress, when you're going through grief, when you're going through pressures, when, when you're going through those things, no doubt Satan is going to look. He's, war, he's walking about, roaring about, seeing whom he may devour. He's watching for the weak and the young, and he's ready. The answer is that we've got to pour our hearts out to the Lord in utter dependency on him when we go through times of grief and stress and, and difficulty in life. Understanding that it's only by his grace and because Jesus himself knows how to help us through the temptation experientially that we can avoid, that we can um, avoid the temptation. Number three, despite our many human frailties, God's goal for us is to experience consistent obedience to his will. That's God's goal. Consistent obedience to his will. Aren't you glad? I, I love the entirety of the word of God when it comes to these disciples. They fail time after time after time. They are immature. They are full of themselves. They are confident in their own flesh. They make stupid decisions. Peter is a buffoon sometimes. Aren't we all? <laughs> and yet God works with Peter. Christ is going to say later on, feed my lambs. He works with him. He, he works with us. His goal is that we would be conformed to the image of Christ. Well, what is Christ's likeness? It is consistent submission to the will of God. It's consistent obedience. And that is God's desire for us as Christians. Maybe you're listening today and you say, well, uh, I don't even know if I'm a Christian. I don't know. You're talking about all of this. Understand that the reason that Jesus went to the cross, the reason he went through the agony he went, went through at the Garden of Gethsemane, the reason that he was anticipating the wrath of God being poured out on him is because it's because of you and me. Our sin placed Jesus on that cross. Our sin causes God, there must be just demands that are, that are satisfied. And we can't satisfy them. You, your good can never outweigh your bad. Neither can mine. So Jesus died so that we could, our sins could be placed on him and so that he could give us his righteousness. And the Bible says, but as many as received him, to them gave you the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Let me encourage you today. If you are not sure of where you stand with the Lord, Christ has gone, he's agonized in suffering for you so that you can receive it by faith. Come and talk with me afterwards. I'd be really thrilled to take a Bible and show you how you can know for sure that you will spend eternity with the Lord and you can have a relationship with him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you this morning and we praise you for this wonderful, dramatic, extremely helpful story about, about how Christ learned obedience. And we have much to learn from his example. We confess before you, Father, that there are so many times 
that when we come under strain and pressure and stress and difficulty, we respond in an ungodly manner. We respond like these disciples, where we just try to keep a stiff upper lip, or we flee. But we don't bear our souls to you. We don't come to you in utter dependence, pouring out our heart before you. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would help us. Help us to follow the example of Christ. Help us to be able to say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. And we thank you for that privilege of being able to say that. Help us to learn obedience. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Hello, my name is Jim Ganam, Senior Pastor of Bethel Baptist Church. I'd like to take a minute to thank you for streaming our service. We hope and pray that it was truly a blessing to you. You know, we live in a day where we have access to the preaching of God's Word with just a phone or a tablet or with a couple of clicks on our computer. But we really would love to meet you in person. You know, there is just nothing that really replaces the experience of being in a loving community. Here at BBC, you'll be greeted by people who genuinely want to help you to have the best experience you can possibly have. If you have a family, we can help your kids find their fun, interactive classes, and your littlest ones can get settled into our safe, fun, and well-equipped nursery. Then help yourself to a cup of coffee and join us for the main service for singing, praying, and the preaching of God's Word. Although we'd love to have you visit our church, this is not our greatest concern for you. Our greatest concern is that you know how to have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. In fact, I want to let you know about a resource that will help you with this. It is called The Exchange. The Exchange is an easy-to-use, four-week guide that helps people to learn how they can have a relationship with God according to the Bible. If you contact us, we'd love to give you a copy while supplies last, and we'd also love to meet with you either in person or over the phone or over a FaceTime or a Zoom video call so we can walk you through this helpful resource. If you're interested in going through the Exchange Bible Study with us, or if you just have a need we can pray for, please email us. May the Lord richly bless you. We hope to see you soon. Hello, my name is Jim Ganam, Senior Pastor of Bethel Baptist Church. I'd like to take a minute to thank you for streaming our service. We hope and pray that it was truly a blessing to you. You know, we live in a day where we have access to the preaching of God's Word with just a phone or a tablet or with a couple of clicks on our computer. But we really would love to meet you in person. You know, there is just nothing that really replaces the experience of being in a loving community. Here at BBC, you'll be greeted by people who genuinely want to help you to have the best experience you can possibly have. If you have a family, we can help your kids find their fun, interactive classes, and your littlest ones can get settled into our safe, fun, and well-equipped nursery. Then help yourself to a cup of coffee and join us for the main service for singing, praying, and the preaching of God's Word. Although we'd love to have you visit our church, this is not our greatest concern for you. Our greatest concern is that you know how to have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. In fact, I want to let you know about a resource that will help you with this. It is called The Exchange. The Exchange is an easy-to-use, four-week guide that helps people to learn how they can have a relationship with God according to the Bible. If you contact us, we'd love to give you a copy while supplies last, and we'd also love to meet with you either in person or over the phone or over a FaceTime or a Zoom video call so we can walk you through this helpful resource. If you're interested in going through the Exchange Bible Study with us, or if you just have a need we can pray for, please email us. May the Lord richly bless you. We hope to see you soon.